Y'all remember the story? When word was sent to Jesus that Lazarus had died and then he waited and he went. They said, by, time, by now he's already stinky. He's been so long in the grave. And Jesus goes to the grave, paraphrasing the story here, but he says, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus comes walking out of the tomb. He's alive. The dead man was in the tomb, but now this new man, this new creation came out of the tomb, but the problem is he was still wearing the grave clothes, and Jesus says, get the grave clothes off of him. You know why? Because the old has gone, and the new has come, and he's a new creation, so there's no sense in walking around and living in the old sin nature as the old man, because you are a new creation, and it's not grave clothes I want you to be wearing, but I've got this new robe to put on you, which is the robe of righteousness, not only to cover all the junk and all your past but also to illuminate what I put on the inside of you. Woo! Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love that we don't deserve but we thank you for it. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your love that's unwavering, unfailing, never leaves us, never forsakes us, always with us, leading us, guiding us, supporting us, lifting us up. It's your business. It's your isness because you are love. He is love. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for the love that you shed abroad in our hearts. Thank you for forgiving us. Woo! Thank you for your love. Thank you for the light that brought us out of the grave, that brought us out of the darkness. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. It's the love of the Father. It's the love of the Father. And the love of the Father is here this morning. Let me tell you, Daddy's home this morning. Daddy's in the house this morning. Not to judge you, not for his wrath to be poured out on you, but for his love to be poured out on you. He's a loving father. He's a good, good father. He's full of love, and his love is here this morning. Don't be scared of daddy coming home. Run to the father. He just wants to put the ring on your finger. He wants to put the robe around you. He wants to put the slipper on your foot. He wants to kill the fattened calf and throw a party because that's how much he loves you. Praise the Lord. The anointing that breaks the yoke. And the Holy Spirit is here. We're gathered together in one accord in unity, in faith, believing, ears open, hearts receptive, ready to hear, ready to leave here better than we came in, to draw closer to you. We're just standing here in your presence this morning. Just waiting to hear your voice. We know you have the answers to every question that we may have. It's no accident that you're here this morning. It's an appointment that was made before you were ever in your mother's womb. It's God's blueprint for your life. Praise the Lord. I know we usually shake hands with two or three, but scratch that. Let's just get into the Word. Y'all can be seated.
I've experienced some anointed praise and worship in my life. A lot of it. A lot of it. But no more anointing. I've never, I'm ne- that was the most anointed praise and worship I've ever tangibly felt in my body right there, those last two songs in my entire life. And that explains a lot. Because I, I heard from the Lord this morning in my office, and I didn't react uh, accordingly, but I know, I know. Right before my wife, my wife was in there, Jackie was in there. Before she walked out, I had my eyes closed. And I was listening. <clears throat> and I know he told me to go get everybody out of Sunday school and come on in the sanctuary right then and right there and let's get going. But I didn't, but we're here now. Amen. Let me touch on this real quick. Last week. I want to correct one thing that I said. I was talking about going into the Old Testament, and I said you need not go into the Old Testament without a sponsor, and the sponsor is Jesus, and you put your Jesus goggles on. I said you need to read through the Old Testament a couple times before you even go into the Old Testament. That makes no sense. I hope most of you picked up what I meant was read through the New Testament a time or two, get familiar with it, then you go into the Old Testament, then all of a sudden you start to see Jesus on the pages, and it's not that confusing. Amen. The other thing is I told a story about a demon coming to my house, but I didn't say demon and it sounded like a person. That a person came to my house. And and um, so people were calling me going, tell me about this person that came to your house. It wasn't a person, it was a demon. Had it been a person, it would have been an entirely different ending to the story. <laughs> You've been reading about the local pastor that was arrested for killing someone. With a toothpick. <laughs> but no, this demon did show up, but demons are dark and dark can't stay where the light is, so the demon had to leave. Amen? Yeah. One of the last things I said last week was talking about the degree of love, and I was talking about love and talking about light, and I said, you know, the de- degree of love, which is in you and me, the degree in which we know that we're loved. Because the love's not going to be in you unless you know your love from the Father. Amen? And uh, that's where it comes from because He is love. So the degree in which you know you're loved is the degree in which the light that you'll produce. We're talking about producing light. That Jesus, you know, He's light. And we're supposed to be light. Light in the dark world and the world's getting darker and we need to be shining brighter. Amen? The degree in which you love, I mean, understand God's love for you will be the same degree in which you shed light. If you don't know how much God loves you, you're not going to be putting off light. If you think God's always critical and looking down his nose at you, picking you apart, you're not going to put off any light. You're actually going to be the opposite of that. You're going to put off darkness because you're going to become a critical person yourself. Because when you're full of criticism, you think God's criticizing you, picking you apart, then all of a sudden now you're going to start doing the same thing to others. So if you know somebody that's critical, this should be a clue as to why. So don't get mad at them. Just understand they haven't experienced the love of God, maybe at the level that you have, or they wouldn't be so critical. Amen. Praise the Lord. Oh, Lord, thank you, Jesus. So Daddy, Daddy's home. That's, that's a title that, that, you know, I didn't have a title. Because on the way to church, I asked Jackie, she teaches a women's group. That's my wife, in case you don't know. I said, what if you were going to church on Wednesday night to do the women's group and you had zero clue as to what you were going to talk about? How would you feel? She said, well, I would think it would be a good night to combine the men and women. (laughs) And I said, well, that's where I'm at, combine the men and women with zero clues. So I began to sit in my office and just write down a couple of thoughts here, a few thoughts, and uh, not don't even know if I'll use them or get into all of it, a little here, a little there. I don't know. It don't matter. It's all good, isn't it? It's all good. Whatever we share will be good because it's going to be the Word of God. I'm not up here to talk about politics. One thing we talked about last week, you know, let me, let, let me stop right here for a second. Daddy's home. Daddy's home. That's an expression that's used. When your daddy gets home, 
Some people didn't have a daddy, so they didn't know what that was like. But you hear people say it, and you see it on movies and television shows, and moms say, when your daddy gets home, I'm going to tell your daddy. I don't think you should do that. I think you should, if it's worthy of telling daddy when daddy gets home, go ahead and beat that butt right then. Because here's what happens. Now the, kid, the little kid associates daddy coming home and beating me. So I'm scared daddy's going to come home because every time daddy comes home, he pulls out the belt and tears me up. Don't do that to the dad's moms. And dads, don't be disrespecting your wife in front of your children because your children are going to grow up to disrespect her too. And don't get mad when they disrespect her because they just watched you do it. Daddy's home. Daddy's home. And sometimes mama, you know, hey, when the boys got a little older where Jackie would beat them with the belt and it didn't hurt them and they just laughed, guess what? They didn't want daddy to hold the belt. So sometimes she would say, I'll tell you daddy. There was a fear, but it wasn't a fear because um, daddy's coming home with judgment and wrath. I think uh, now it was a fear of respect and love. It's a difference. There's a difference. And a lot of people are scared of God in fear. And that's just not the God we serve. Amen. Amen. So first point, beat the kids. <laughs> but we look as God as like, like that, as the judge. And we talked about that last week, judge. And confused, well, God's love, but God's a judge. And God's love, but he's wrath. I thought he's mercy, but now he's wrath, he's judgment, but I thought he's love. Well, let's talk about all this, but. You, 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 God is judge, judge. you got to completely divorce that, like I said last week, from the, this Western courtroom notion that he's wearing a black robe up there with a the gavel and there's a jury box. and then all, that, that, That's not it. The judge is not coming to give you a sentence. The, the judge is coming after what's coming after you. The judge is coming what's keeping you from knowing your true identity. In other words, if you want to know what God looks like as a judge, read your Bible and read the book of Judges. And in the book of Judges, you would see the nation of Israel, his people, who would be living a life of infidelity, and there would be consequences from that life. And he would raise up a judge to rescue them from the consequences of the infidelity. He came after what was coming after them. I hope you see that. And he would raise up judges to do this. And he would raise up, you know, there was just off the top of my head some, some good ones and some of my favorites. But everybody knows Samson. I say everybody, I shouldn't say everybody does. But most people have heard of Samson and Samuel, Gideon. Uh, what's uh, Jeff Fath or something like that? You know, I can't pronounce all these names. Shamgar, but for all the ladies, guess what? He raised up a judge named Deborah. And she whooped some booty. But see, the children, there's something coming after the children of Israel. And sin, infidelity, they had been unfaithful to God. So there's consequences. So God would raise up a judge. Well, look at yourself the same way. We live infidel lives of infidelity. And you say, well, I've never done that to my spouse. I haven't been unfaithful. I'm talking about unfaithful to God. We are called the bride of Christ. The church is the bride of Christ. Has everybody been faithful to Him? You've been faithful to Him your entire life? No, you have not. Nobody has. You've gone out and cheated on Him many times. Some people cheated on Him this morning before you got here. But guess what? His wrath, His judgment is not coming after you. It's coming after what's coming after you. The wrath of God is nothing to be scared of. He should actually excite you. How in the world is that? How could that be exciting? Well, he's raised up another judge. Just like he rose up the judge in, in the Old Testament, in the book of Judges, there's a new judge that's been risen. But not just any judge, but this is a, the son of man. 
who not has just been lifted up, risen up, but he was risen up out of the grave for you and me to deliver us from our infidelity, from the consequences of our sin. Amen. The judge of all judges, there's not going to be another one. There's no need for another one. He took care of the business. Praise the Lord. So that we can walk into our identity. And so Jesus is our judge. I just don't want people to believe things because, well, they said so. Who said so? Granny and them? Over at that church over there? I grew up there. It's what they said. It must be so. Not true. You need to dig into the Word for yourself. Do some study and do some reading. Let God speak to you instead of just believing uh, every, everything you hear. You be a good little Christian. You've not been called to be a good little Christian. You've been called to shed some light. And you'll never shed light trying to be a good little Christian. I am a Christian. But I'm not trying to be a good little Christian. I'm trying to be the man God's called me to be. And the way that I'm going to be the man God's called me to be, it's a totally different uh, avenue to get there than what I used to think. I realize now what it is. I'm never going to be that man. You'll never be that man, that woman. Never. Unless we understand how much God loves you. And the goodness of God, the mercy of God, and the love that's been shed abroad in your heart. Unless you understand that, you'll never reach it. You'll never reach it. Just gritting your teeth, clenching your fence, trying to be a good little boy. Because what you do is you spend your life fighting what you're not. And that's not what He's called you to be. That's not what He's told you to do. Praise the Lord. Abraham wasn't... uh, nobody in the Old Testament had a clear revelation of God because Jesus hadn't come and Jesus says, hey, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I am Him. Now you know. Whatever questions you had, here's the answer. Right here, walking around in the flesh. Praise the Lord. But Abraham uh, sought, the, sought God. It took, it took courage. And following that was persecution. But guess what? Following that was a little bit of money. A little bit, yeah, because he was the father of the entire world. Y'all didn't know that? The blessings of Abraham were upon us. My father owns a cattle on a thousand hills. The blessings are upon us. So Abraham sought the Lord. And so I just think that sometimes people make the Word of God very complex you can't understand it there's confusion and you just just believe what granny and them said but what we need to do as teachers and preachers and believers of Christ is to take the word that people have made complex and make it a little more palatable because if it's easier to chew on you'll swallow it if it tastes good you'll eat some more of it you ever ate something you didn't like that somebody fixed you and gave it to you and they're looking at you eat it and every bite is getting bigger and bigger in your mouth and you finally swallow it and you're like I know I'm not supposed to break the commandments, but yeah, that was good. <laughs> and it really wasn't. Well, this word's good. <laughs> Somebody's done that recently, sounds like. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's good. It's good. Y'all newlyweds, you better tell your wife when she cooks that food that's no good. You, oh, baby, that's so good. It's so good. The only thing better than this is you. It's so good, I'm going to take you out to eat tomorrow night so you ain't got to cook. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, I've never done that. I was radically saved. We've all been radically saved, whether you realize it or not. Radically saved. What I mean is, not rescued from the judicial propensity of an angry father but rather rescued from the delusion that has kept us from becoming the image that he created us to be that's what Jesus did rescued us from that in other words we're created Adam and Eve go back to the beginning created in, in God's own image that's your blueprint that's what you're supposed to be that's what I'm supposed to be that's what we are called to be created to be is that right there 
That's the I am. Who are you? I am that. I'm created to be that, just like the I am. Because we're supposed to be just like Jesus. And if you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. We're supposed to be imitators of Christ. But if you've seen Christ, you've seen the Father. Therefore, we're imitators of God. He's the great I am. But he created us to be basically little I am. And he said, here's two trees. He, it, or he said, here's a whole garden. This whole garden's the I am. And this one tree over here is the I am not tree. And Adam goes over here and eats from the I am not tree. And you and I are not supposed to be eating from the I am not tree because there's a blueprint that God has given every one of us. It's a blueprint of your life. And the blueprint is about what you am. The I am. I don't care about the grammar. Forget that. What, the, what you are. The I am. But he ate from the I am tree. So then we preach. You spend your whole life pointing out what you're not, the, the, what, the am not tree, and you am not that, and you am not that, and you am not that, and you need to fight that. Instead of focusing on what you am not, what you are not, that you, the fact that you've eaten from the I am not tree, we need to start focusing on the I am. I am because the I am is the blueprint. Why do you want to be looking at a blueprint of an imposter? Because if you're anything other than what God's created you to be, it's not you. It's not the I am. It's the I am not. And the I am not is an imposter. I preached a sermon one time called the imposter. In other words, it's not me. It's the imposter. Because that's not, I am not that. I am this. Praise the Lord. I hope y'all are picking up what I'm laying down trying to. In other words, we're taught there's two natures. There's a sin nature and there's this new nature. So what you need to do is spend your whole life fighting this sin nature. So now we're focused on fighting this sin all your life and you're fighting this sin and we even teach it this way. And I think sometimes it's just it's a good way to explain it, but maybe sometimes it's not perceive the way that it goes forth and maybe sometimes people are just mixed up I don't know but we say there's there's two dogs living on the inside of you which one are you going to feed feed one and starve the other no there's two dogs trying to live on the inside of you but I'm telling you right now if you're born again there ain't but one dog because the old has gone and the new creation is you and that's just the one I am the one single dog Quit looking at the old dog. He's gone. He's dead and buried. Now the old dog tries to rear his head up and religion tries to remind you who you used to be and of all your sins and all your mistakes and all your failures and daddy's coming home. But that's just not, that's incorrect. That's just incorrect. What that does is creates duplicity as long as you think there's duplicity you're going to live a life thinking that there's duplicity there's two natures in me no there's one nature the righteousness of God who you're created to be that's what he's put in you the old nature is dead and gone it's gone the word of God tells you 2 Corinthians 5 and 17 read it behold guess what you're a new creation the old's gone, the new has come. Here, right here I am. I was this old sinful man living in sin, but that guy went into the grave, and Jesus said, come out of the grave, and I come walking out of the grave. But the problem is, just like Lazarus, many times we're walking around still wearing grave clothes of the old man. But he's saying, take the old grave clothes off. Those, those don't fit you anymore. Man, I got this new robe to put over you. It's a robe of righteousness. Praise the Lord. All right, let's see. Let's, let's look around right here so we want to get into. We may just stay in this right here. Paul says this. Paul says, he says, uh, if I sin, it's not me. He actually says that. He says, if I sin, it's not me. That's that imposture. So, Hope there's no young kids in here that are going to use that on your mom and dad. When your mom and dad get on to you and say, that's not me. That's the, that's the imposter. That's what Apostle Paul said. 
When I sin, when I make mistakes, when I get into these things, it's not me. It's not me. It's not me. That's the same mindset me and you had to have. He's trying to tell us something. That's, that's, that's the I am not. But I am. And I'm going to eat from the I am tree. The tree of life. And I'm going to step into this blueprint to who I've been created to be. Are y'all following me? There shouldn't be duplicity. That's when you're like an infant tossed to and fro, going back and forth, and you're being tugged one way and the other. Don't even recognize that. Just ignore it. It's not even there. Don't talk about a dead man. He's dead. Put him in the grave and leave him there. Quit bringing him back out. Quit bringing out everybody's past and pointing out their faults and failures. Forget that. We're going forward. We're not looking behind us. And Satan's going to try to remind you of everything in your past. And he's going to try to remind you of everything in your spouse's past. He's going to try to remind you of everything in your mom and daddy's past. He always tries to bring up the past because he wants the past to stop you from going into the future. The past is just that, the past. You can't change it. It's past. But the past will absolutely derail you from ever going into the future that you're called to go into and to become the uh, man or woman, the, to step into the identity. Satan's got a blueprint. God's got a blueprint. God's blueprint's the I am, and Satan's blueprint's the I am not. I got a set of blueprints riding around the back seat of my truck. And if I'll follow those blueprints, there's going to be something that will be erected that's going to be beautiful. But I could go get an entirely different set of blueprints and build that. And the person's going to say, Well, that's not what I wanted. So the blueprint's important. Sticking to the plan, sticking to the book, sticking to the instruction manual. Amen. Every answer to every question you'll ever have is in this book right here. So if we're ever going to be like God, we must see Him as He is. And Jesus shows us who He is. He says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So when we learn who we are and not who you are not, then we're going to enter into this. Amen? This life of duplicity, when you're looking at, at it both ways, then you're like a hamster running on the wheel. And you just run and run and run, but you're not getting anywhere. You're just going to spin that wheel and keep spinning that wheel, but you're not going anywhere trying to get better, trying to do better, trying to be the man you've been called to be. But if you're expecting duplicity, then you're going to see duplicity because as a man thinks, so is he. But the reason we expect it is because we're taught it. And I want us all to move into... uh, of an expectation of what that... Um, what we should be producing, which is light. Amen? Y'all with me? You had not drifted off. We're still here. Good, 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 good. We'll save this for another day. Praise the Lord. We need to understand our status, understand what our status is. And um, let me look right here, 1 Corinthians. I didn't give you any scriptures because I didn't have any scriptures, but um, I know scripture. I know a couple. In 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter and the 22nd verse, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive, which backs up everything that I just said. In Adam. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Amen. All die, all live. Everything dies. So there's uh, not going to ever be an expectation of anything. If you are, if you have this um, idemic living operating in you, if you have this way of thinking operating in you, that's you're never going to overcome this. Is what I'm telling you. But we have Christ in us, and all have all died so that all can live. Amen. I mean, you can go back to the children of Israel. They're fixing to cross the flooded Jordan River. 
And this is a type and shadow of things to come. And they have the uh, Ark of the Covenant there. And this river's at flood stage. It's out of the banks. And they're going to cross the river. They sought the Lord. And the Lord said to wade out into the river and carry this box. It's just a wooden box. But guess what the box represented? It represented Jesus Christ. And so you just carried the box. And everybody else, the whole nation, followed the box. The box is leading the way. That's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. What sense does that make? The, the river's flooded. We're going to carry this box out in the river, and we're all just to follow the box. We're going to follow it out here and just drown? Well, no, because when they carried the box out into the river, the river dried up 20 miles upstream to a city named Adam, which backs up that scripture. That died. Now we're alive in Christ, all the way back to Adam. Praise the Lord. So if you have that way of thinking, that idemic way of thinking, if that's even a word, I'm not sure, but it sounds good to me. If you have that way of thinking, you're not ever going to step into this. Uh, you're not going to have an expectation of anything. But you've got to have an expectation, expectation, because Christ is in us. He's in us. The hope of glory. Amen. So if Christ, the hope of glory, is in us, then let's be who He says we should be. Let's be who He says we should be. He said we should be the head, not the tail. He says we should be the first and not the last, above and not beneath. We should be a lender and not a borrower. We should be victors, victors, victors. We should be victorious. We should be more than conquerors. Amen. That no weapon formed against us shall proper, prosper. A thousand may fall at my side, ten thousand in my right hand, but no evil will come nigh my dwelling. That's what he's saying about you. That's what we need to step into and start living that life. That I can do all things through Christ Jesus who gives me strength. That maybe things are impossible with man, but nothing's impossible with God. And by his stripes we were healed, past tense. Step into these things. Amen. That's what he's called us to be. Living in, we need to live in accordance to these promises and not be double-minded because God's love. We say God's love, but God's wrath. Well, God's mercy, but God is also judge. See, we're looking at justice and wrath totally the wrong way. We're looking at his darkness, and there's no darkness found in God because he's pure light, and we covered that last week. There's not one sliver, not one ounce of darkness found in God. He is pure light. So that means judgment and wrath has to be from the light, which has to be from the love because God is love because love is his isness. That's what he is. Praise the Lord. So maybe the season of your life is connected to justice, but the justice is connected to love. Maybe this season of your life is connected to wrath, but the wrath, that branch, that connected to love. Amen. That's his isness. So wrath's nothing scary. Wrath's actually something good. That's great. That's actually wrath is the most radical uh, uh, description of the love of God because the love of God is coming after what's coming after you. The love of God is coming after what is stopping you from entering in that identity of I am. Rather than living a life of I am not and, and I am. Well, I am not and, and now I am. And now there's duplicity and you're confused and you just like forget the whole thing. Because Brother Bobby told me. And Sister Sally with her hair in the bun and a dress dragging the floor told me. She knew I was a sinner and the wrath of God's coming after me. Yeah, it's coming after you, but it's coming after what's coming after you. Some people that have worn their hairs in buns and long blue jean skirts are offended. I can sense it. Nothing gets hair in buns. I love hair in buns. Because underneath those hair, in that bun... Or a lot of wisdom. But sometimes there's also duplicity because that's what they were taught. And um, I think we need to dig into the Word and see what the Word of God says. 
Satan says to Jesus when he's out in the wilderness, he says, if you are the Son of God. But when Jesus comes up out of the waters of bath, baptisms and the Holy Spirit sits on his shoulder, he said, this is my beloved Son. Also at the Mount Transfiguration, he said, shut your pie hole. This is my beloved Son. Listen to him. That's, I paraphrase that one. But he basically said, shut up. Quit talking, Peter. Stop. Listen to him, my beloved son. But Satan comes and says, if you're the son, he left out that one word. And that same one word, beloved, the beloved, the beloved, is the same word many of us are missing. We, maybe we feel like a child of God, a son, a daughter, but not the beloved. But I'm here to tell you that you are the beloved. That's how he's looking at you. That's how he's looking at me. That's how much he loves us. My grandma told me before church, she said, if, if you, my grandchildren, only knew how much that I loved you, it would give you the big head. And I said, well, come on, give me the big head. I need to know. I need to know. I need to know how much you love me. I need to know how much God loves me because I'll never become who I was created to be until I understand how much God loves me. And sometimes God loves you through other people first. That's why you need to be loving on other folks and not looking down your nose, condemning them, pointing out to all their faults and failures. Every time they messed up, that's not what God does. That's not what Jesus did. Jesus just loved them. I used to get mad and angry at people. My grandma would say, you just got to love them. And I'm thinking, I don't want to love them. I want to punch them in the face repeatedly. <laughs> Seriously. But that's not who I am. That's who I am not. She knew who she was before I knew who I was. I'm still trying to learn who I am because sometimes I still want to punch people in the face. You understand? And if I did that, if I did it every time I felt it, I would, a couple people in here would be bleeding right now probably. Well, that means just wake your butt up, quit sleeping, give God some reverence. That wasn't very loving. <laughs> I mean, it just wasn't. I mean, I'm your pastor, but I'm struggling, okay? I just think it's important. I just think the Word of God's important. Sorry that I take it serious. I may seem a little intense. I, I am intense about it. I'm not mad about it. Sometimes people think I'm mad. Call me the angry preacher. Say you look mean and you look mad. The only person I'm mad at is the enemy. I ain't mad at, mad at none of you. I love all of you. But I do give reverence to the things of God. And I take this serious. This is the most serious thing in my life. Nothing even remotely comes close to the word. And when people don't take it serious and they disrespect it. Yeah. Sometimes I get a little frustrated. But we're going to keep going. You'll get there. You'll wake up one day. Praise the Lord. Wait till daddy gets home. Wait till daddy gets home. See, that's not bad news. That's actually good news. That's actually very good news. Wait till daddy gets home. Because when daddy comes home, he's, he's coming to rescue you. He's bringing some love. He's bringing some mercy. He's coming after what's coming after you. When daddy gets home. When daddy gets home. He's not coming to beat you with the belt to correct you and beat you. He's coming to love you because love actually casts out fear. Perfect love casts out fear. And so you fear what you hate. You fear what you hate. Think about it. Things you fear are things you hate. I am fearful of spiders. I hate spiders. But most people are fearful, fearful of what they hate, which was why perfect love cast out fear, because love and hate are polar opposites. So the love of God comes in, the hate goes out. No, now you're not in fear anymore. That's good. And I didn't even go to Bible college. <laughs> I went to Holy Spirit University, though. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Where do y'all want to go? Let's go. Let's get into something. I, let's, there's a lot of places we could go. Uh, let's, let's just get in the book of John real quick. Uh, this one, let, let's pick up right here. I, I, I made mention of this last week. Let's, let, let's, let's get back right here. Uh, where do I want to start? 
the book of John. Let's see. Let's just start in the let's just start in the very first verse. There's no better place to start in the beginning. Amen. Batteries, but fortunately I have on this lapel, so it's good. I need both hands anyway, so I can hold my Bible. It's all good. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning, he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and told them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman called in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was called in adultery in the very act. And they said, Now Moses in the law commanded that, uh, 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 us that such be stoned. But what do you say? So they've called her in the act of adultery, so they bring her in, throw her down at the feet of Jesus, and they say, in, in Moses' law, Jesus, it says that she's supposed to be stoned. I know we're supposed to carry her out to the gates of the city, and the elders of the city are going to stand around her and smash her head in with stones until dead. That's what we're supposed to do. That's what we're supposed to do is do that right there. Where's the man at? Or in this age, people may say, where's the other woman? I mean, how do you commit adultery by yourself? Well, the only way you can really commit adultery by yourself, and it's not really by yourself, but you can sit in front of your computer screen and commit adultery. No, I didn't know that was a thing. It's a very real thing. Because anything outside the marriage of a man and woman is adultery, and you show ain't married to nobody on that computer screen. Stone them. Stone her. Let's stone her. Where's the other person at? Was she entrapped? Was she tricked? I don't know. The Bible doesn't record that. But they're bringing her, they're bringing her there because they're wanting to try to get Jesus in a trap. But this they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. They weren't, they weren't even interested in accusing her. They're just wanting to accuse him. They can't stand him. Why? Love. Love. Because he's loving sinners. Can't stand it. They don't deserve that. Only us religious people do. But Jesus didn't come for the sick. He came, I mean, for the well, he came for the sick. And what's funny, I don't think the religious were well. They were even more sick. They just didn't know it. Anyway, let's move on. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. Didn't even respond to them. Didn't even acknowledge Anything they said, he stoops down the ground. I talked about that last week. I talked about not losing the gaze, and I think that she's downcast, and she's looking down in shame. I think he got down in there, down where they could see eye to eye, and she could see something she had never seen before in her life, and it was love. The love of the Father, she probably didn't have one. If she did, he's probably a deadbeat. It was probably one of them deals. When Daddy gets home, and she's fearful of him, so she's out trying to find love somewhere else, trying to find approval somewhere else, and trading her body for attention and approval, because that's what happens, unfortunately. And Jesus says, he's looking at her eye to eye. So they continued asking him, who him, he, he responded, who, He who is without sin among you, let him throw the first stone at her. And then he stooped down and wrote on the ground again. They, the, those who heard it, being convicted, they started leaving one by one, from the oldest to the youngest, started dropping their rocks and started walking away. And Jesus and her were left alone. And Jesus says to the woman, where are your accusers now? No one's here to condemn you. And she said, no, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in the darkness, but have the light of life. And so here's what people get confused, and people have taught this. But basically there's God's wrath and God's judgment, and that's what that lady deserved. She deserved to have her head smashed in with stones and killed. And Jesus came and got between her and the Father to protect her from God's judgment. And that's not what happened at all. Jesus came to show humanity what God does with broken people. He loves them. 
That's what he does with broken people. He loves them. He didn't say, why did you do that? He didn't rebuke her. He didn't get on to her. He didn't fuss out. He didn't say anything to her. He just says, where are your condemners now? Go and sin no more. In other words, it's just love. It's just love. That's how God deals with broken people. We read the story of the prodigal son last week. Or I think I covered it a little bit. Did you know that when a son disrespects his father like that in, in that culture, guess what they did? Carried him out to the city gate. Elders stood around and smashed their head in with rocks and killed him. You didn't disrespect your parents or you died. You died if you disrespected your parents. So we call him the prodigal son. He's really not the prodigal son. Prodigal son means lavish living. He did do that, but I'm not going to uh, uh, re refer to him by uh, his mistake and give him that identity because I don't think that's what God wants us to do. I think it's what man and religion wants you to do, but he's actually the redeemed heir. So he comes home and he concocts this story. Of what he's going to tell his dad, Dad, I'm sorry, and, and, I, and I shouldn't have done that, and, and I don't even deserve to be your son anymore, and, and, and just treat me like a hired help, and just put me out there with a hired help. I don't, I, his dad goes, hey, kill that fat calf. We're fixing to have a party right here. Bring him the robe, bring him the ring, bring him the slipper, and he redeemed his son. That's what love does. The scripture is showing us how God deals with broken people, and it's not by smashing your head in with a rock. And he's not getting in between you and God because he is God. Because if you've seen him, you've seen the Father. Y'all picking this up? Y all, y all, I hope so. How much God loves you. How much God loves you. He's, he, he, he's for you. He's not against you. Amen. He's for you, not against you. There's another woman at the well. I think it's in John 4. And the woman goes to the well. And Jesus is with his disciples. Now this woman who's at the well has got a bad reputation. She's been married five times and the dude she's shacked up with now is not even her husband. So she's at the well all alone. Jesus goes out of his way so that he can meet this woman. And they get there and there's, there's, there's the woman. And he says, hey guys, why don't y'all go in town and give me, get us something to do? I'm kind of hungry. Leave me here alone with this woman with his reputation, I can only imagine what would happen if I got all the men from the men's group and we come walking and there's a good-looking, attractive woman. I say, hey, you know, don't y'all have something you need to do? Don't y'all need to go somewhere? I need to go witness to her. And if my wife found out, ooh, it would be bad. It would be really bad. But I noticed Jesus... That didn't stop him. He, he, he went, he looked for those people. He looked for those people that were looked down at. He looked for those people that had been cast out of the city that nobody wanted anymore. They were just called little dogs. Bad reputation. But he goes and says, hey, give me a drink. And they start having a communication. She gets a drink of some living water. Then this woman with this bad reputation goes back to the city. Now she's telling everybody about Jesus. Was it him condemning her and telling her how bad she was and all that she had done wrong? No, he said, hey, guess what? You've been looking for happiness and you've been looking for fulfillment. You've been looking for love with all these dudes, but those five never did give it to you. This one you're living with now, he's not going to either, but the one that will is standing right here in front of you, and this is living water. If you'll just get you a drink of this love right here, you'll never thirst again. And for a lot of years, I tried to be Jackie's savior. I did. I did. I tried to be. But I looked no further. Here it is, everything you ever need right here. <laughs> I can't replace Jesus. I can't replace Jesus. I can't be a provider, and I can't be a protector. And I live by that right there. Because I told her the other day, I said, don't you ever forget this. I said, don't you ever make decisions based off our resources. You make decisions based off who I am, who you're married to. That's how you make decisions, whether good ones or bad ones. You know me, you know my love, you know who I am. You make decisions based off that, and I'll make decisions based off the same thing. It ain't about resources. See, I'm the provider. I am the protector. But I'm not the Savior. I mean, you ain't going to be the Savior. There's a love that you can't feel in that woman's heart. There's a spot you can feel, 
but you can't replace the love of the Father. You can show the love of the Father, but everybody needs the love of the Father. See, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy's home, and he's not coming with wrath and judgment, and he's not bringing hell with him. You hear people say that? I'm coming, I'm bringing hell with me. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Ooh, scary. You're already defeated, you idiot. I mean, ooh, scary stuff. <laughs> Goofballs. Anyway. No, nah, I shouldn't say they're not goofballs. You know what they are? They're uh, children of God, but they just don't know who they are, and they don't, they've been eating from the I am not tree, and therefore they say stupid things like that. And so what we need to do is shine some love and not call them stupid idiots like I just did. See, I told you, I'm, 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 here we are. It's a, it's a work in progress. I'm still on the mold. He's, I'm still clay in the potter's hand. We ain't got there quite yet. We're starting to look like something, though. We're going in the right direction at least, amen? 1151. Y'all getting hungry yet? I think that the Baptists, they're already up there. And the Methodists are too. I mean, they're already up there eating right now. They're at Longhorns eating the steak right now. And Italian, what's that, Olive Garden and Jim and Nick. There's no sense in hurrying up there. You just have to wait. Might as well just stay here, right? That's what I'm talking about, all right? All I need is one Amen. Now, we're about done, but there's so many examples. Peter, Jesus is teaching. Actually, it was the next chapter after uh, when we were sharing about the redeemed heir. Actually, in the very next chapter, that's, that's Luke 4 and Luke 5. Jesus is teaching. He says, hey, push, let me get out in that boat right there because the crowd's coming around. Let me get out here so you know they can all hear me get back a little bit. And uh, it was Peter's boat. And afterwards, he said, hey, Peter, let's, let's push out a little further. Cast your net right there. And he said, nah, I've been fishing all night, and we ain't caught anything. This is not the right time to fish because the sun's shining. You're supposed to fish at night because the water's clear. They're going to see the net. No fish are going to swim into the net. So basically, it's a complete waste of time. But that's your word. I'll do it. So he does it. Catch all the fish. So many fish. His boat's sinking. His partners come to help him. Get all the fish in. Did Peter deserve any of that? He's a sinful man. He even said so. He came out of the boat, fell on his knees and says, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. I don't deserve this isness, this love that's your business. I just don't love, I just don't deserve that your isness. And Jesus says, Get up. Come on, let's go. I'm going to teach you to be a fisher of man. That's the love of the Father right there. The love of the Father is when we don't feel like we deserve it and we're on our knees and we're saying, depart from me for I am a sinful man. The love of the Father says, come on, I want to teach you. I want to teach you, come on, go. let's go on a journey. We read it last week. Let's go on a walk. Let's go on a journey. I, I, I'm going to teach you how to be light and how to shed light. Come on with me. He didn't say, you daggum right, you don't deserve it. Better be glad I didn't do. That's just not the love of the Father. You ever read and get confused and don't understand? You're like, I thought God's love, but then over here it says God did this. I don't understand and get confused. You got to look at everything through the lens of Jesus. Through the lens of Jesus. Amen. Through the lens of Jesus. In Luke... See, religion, religion, religion likes that. They like it. They like it. They love it. They love to stand up and preach and tell you about everything you're doing wrong and how all of this is going to send you to hell. Going to hell, boy. Keep doing that sinning. God's wrath, God's judgment. You're not going to make a mockery of him, and you're not going to make a mockery of him, and I preach that too. You're not going to make a mockery of him. But who are we talking to when we talk like that? That's the old man, right? So now it's like, I thought I was a new man. Why are we talking to the old man? I thought he was dead. So that's creating duplicity. Now it's like, oh, I'm supposed to fight this, feed this one, not this one. No. Just be who you're created to be. You're not the other guy. Don't even, don't even acknowledge him. 
Just like the father, the prodigal son, didn't even acknowledge the son. Just like Jesus didn't even acknowledge the Pharisees when they bring the charges, he doesn't even acknowledge them. The prodigal son, the redeemed heir says, Dad, blah, 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 blah. The dad doesn't even respond to him. All he responds to is who his son is. He's my boy. We're going to throw a party. Because he, he had taken what I had given and he had gone out and got in the world like every one of us have. But when we come back, he's not ready to give us 20 lashes. He's putting the robe back on you and redeeming you, restoring you. With what? Love. Love. In Luke 4, real quick, the 18th verse, Jesus says, let me back up to the 17th verse. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. And he is uh, quoting, I think it's Isaiah 61. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recover the sight of the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable, acceptable year of the Lord. And then he closed the... A book, and it says he gave it back to the attendant and he sat down and all the eyes were fixed on him. And he says, today this scripture has been fulfilled. In other words, what he's saying is, that's me. That's me. It's been fulfilled. Here I am, guys. The one you've been waiting on just wrote, Daddy's home. And then he says, and surely I say to you, this is the 24th verse, no prophet is accepted in his own country, but I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah, in Israel, the ones that were in the bloodline, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months and there was a great famine throughout the land. But to none of them was Elijah sent except to Zarephath in the region of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow who was not even in the bloodline. There was plenty that were in the bloodline, but he wasn't sent to them. He, he's telling them something. He said, the ones that you thought were disgusting and outcast, and we don't even drink from the same well, we don't even associate, we sure ain't going to sit at the table with them. That's where Elijah was sent to. That very one, the one that you turned your back on, that's the one Elijah was sent to. Then he goes a little further. And then he says, And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. Naaman the Syrian, the Syrian army, it was their, uh, it was their enemy. The Syrian army was Israel's enemy. Not Furthermore, the Naaman took an Israelite girl, took her home to be a slave. So he took one of them, one of the Israelites home, made her a little slave girl, and the little slave girl said, Naaman, there's a prophet in Israel, and he can heal you. Naaman goes, I am not going to get into all that story, but he gets healed. So Jesus is telling them this. In other words, y'all could have had it. I even showed love and mercy to your enemy. So all in the synagogue heard these things were filled with wrath. They're filled with wrath for two reasons. One, first of all, you said that this scripture is fulfilled, that you're him. You ain't nothing but a carpenter's boy. Now, our king's coming. He's going to be dressed a lot different than you. His hands aren't going to be callous stuff. He's not going to be hanging around with a bunch of sinners and a bunch of prostitutes. Now, he's going to be dressed in royalty. And he's going to defeat the Romans. The judgment is coming. Not on us, because we're in the bloodline. But here's, here's another reason I want to show you. Here's another reason I think they were mad. In the 19th verse, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Well, if you go back and read in Isaiah, it doesn't stop right there. It says to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. Go read it in Isaiah 61. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the vengeance of the Lord our God. Those religious people, they wanted the vengeance. 
They wanted the wrath and they wanted the judgment to come down to condemn and, and, and beat all the sinners. And show y'all how, how us, y'all, we, me, you Gentiles, how we were all wrong and they had it all right. And unfortunately, thousands, 2,000 years later, here we are. Religious people still do the same thing till today. Pointing out duplicity, pointing out the who I am not, and you ate from the I am not tree. And daddy's home. That feels like a good... I mean, hey, it's 12 noon, high noon. Daddy's home. The love of God is home. And it's the love of God that needs to indwell you so that you can become who he's called you to be. Y'all, y'all get anything out of this? Or am I just preaching to my... I got something out of it. I enjoyed it. It's like the most fun thing I ever do in my whole life. Share the word of God. I love it. Why? That's what I was called to do. And guess what? You were too. We're all called to be lights everywhere you go, shedding the light, loving on folks. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's receive the love of God. 12 o'clock. I'm sweating. Is it hot in here? Am I just hot? It's hot, is it? Okay, well, it's probably hot on the cross. Y'all be out. <laughs> Why'd you ask them? Well, I, don't, I really don't know. I was just hoping I was the only one. Maybe it's a different kind of heat that we need. A fire that burns off all the wrong thinking that's been pounded into your head for all these years by religion. You weren't called to be a good little Christian. You are called to be a bright light. What's keeping you from shining? What's keeping you from shining? Because, see, light sheds light. If you're light, you shed light. What's stopping you from shining? Maybe you don't know you're a light. Why not? Maybe because you're looking at the I am not. You're looking at the wrong set of blueprints. I told my wife in the parking lot this morning, sitting right out here, talking about my kids. I said, sometimes each one of them do different things. They're all different. They're all different. They do different things that makes me proud. Like, oh, I, you know, like if, if Kyle's carrying like three 80-pound bags of concrete, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, he's mine. That's where he got it from right here. No, I ain't got that anymore. But I got a pocket knife. I'll cut you. <laughs> and then, like, if walk, walk, Walker blitzes by on a, do, on a two-stroke dirt bike, making one of the most beautiful sounds you'll a grown man will ever hear in his entire life, I, he's mine. That's, he, that's my boy right there. I don't announce it to everyone. Attention, everyone, they're mine. But just, my, I'm proud of my own little heart. You won't sit in my face. I don't, I don't do that. If my son, my other son says, uh, my, third, my oldest son, he's two minutes older than the other ones. If I hear about him, you know, praying out loud publicly, Makes me proud. And if my daughter says, Daddy, the enemy can't cross the bloodline, it makes me proud, you know? But none of those things change my love. I love them regardless. If they was all in prison, I love them. If they all went and joined ISIS, I love them. If they were all in jail right now and waiting for me to come get them up to church, I love them. Proud of that mistake? No. But does that change my love? No. 
Just hang, just hang on because daddy's coming. Oh, that's for somebody. That's like specific right there for somebody who feels. <laughs> who feels like you're in that prison. And it's a prison that you've created. Because we we're given our own free will. I'm not denying that. We have choices. But you're in that prison. And it's like you're just holding the bars. And I'm just, you're here this morning to hear these words right here. Daddy is coming. He's coming. And he's coming to bail you out. And he's going to bring you out of the bondage. He's going to pull you out of that life. The I am not. You've been eating from the I am not tree. And all of a sudden that's created you to be something contrary to what the Word of God tells us that your identity is. Your identity is found in Christ, and that's all died with Adam, but we live in Christ, and He's coming to bring you out of that. Daddy is coming. Daddy's coming. No, Daddy's here. Daddy's here. He's here. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hundred percent. I know without I could point, boy, I could point right at somebody right now. I'm not going to do that. I, I, I'm not going to do that. But I feel this draw like you're the most magnetic piece of metal on planet Earth, and I'm a giant magnet. And I'll tell you that doesn't mean it's that doesn't mean that's the only person. It doesn't mean that. But it's a hundred percent. I see a female, and that love of the daddy. It's just not there because it's never been there. It's never been there. Never I love you. Never I'm proud of you. Never you're pretty. Never you my girl. You daddy's girl. Never felt that. Never felt that love. But you came this morning to hear that those two words right there. Those three words. Daddy. Daddy's coming. Or daddy's home. He's here. The love of the Father. Is here, not to judge you, not to stand between you and the wrath of God, but to show you how much God loves broken people and how God responds to broken people. It's with love. And the woman with a bad reputation, Jesus is eating in the house of Pharisees. And this woman with a bad reputation comes in and gets at his feet. And she's crying. She's washing his feet with her hair. And she's kissing his feet. And religion says, if you knew, I thought you were a prophet. If you knew what manner of a woman that was, you wouldn't let her touch you. (laughs) Daddy's home. Daddy's home. Religion's been telling you that and you've bought into that lie right there. I'm not worthy. I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. I'll never amount. amount. And he's seen all the tears. He's heard all the cries. And he just wants to embrace you this morning with a love that surpasses all understanding. Just let you know he loves you. And the past don't matter. In fact, the past has been demolished. Daddy's home. Praise the Lord. Father, we thank you this morning. We praise you this morning. We enter into your house this morning with reverence, with a great expectancy. Father, we honor your word. We honor your voice. We give you reverence. We just thank you for speaking to us this morning and showing us the true love of the Father. 
and helping us walk in to the man and to the woman that you've called us to be by experiencing the love of Abba Father. And right there where you're sitting, if, if that's you, man, you don't have to get up out of your seat, make a public spectacle. I think it's more of a sit right there this morning and just soak it in. Just soak it up. Just soak it up, just like a sponge, soaking it up, just soaking up the love. Just soaking up the love of the Father this morning. He's just putting his arms around you, saying, I got you. I got you. I love you. Daddy's home. Just receive it. Just receive it. That awkward quietness is good sometimes. Let like the Holy Spirit speak to you. What's he saying to you? You bought into that lie? Well, Satan's the father of lies. Praise the Lord. It's a funny ending spot right here. Funny ending spot.